Hi, everybody. I am Cynthia Garrett. I am your host. Welcome to the Cynthia Garrett podcast. And uh, today I have kind of a special episode for you because every now and then I do these conversations with other people as a guest on their podcasts or on live radio, um, on television, whatever the case may be. And I just really loved this very laid back conversation that I had with a gentleman named Shane O'Neill. Shane is the host of The Naked Gospel, not to be confused with The Naked Truth, my new book, but yes, we did find it funny because I went on The Naked Gospel to discuss The Naked Truth, my new book. And uh, Shane loves to have conversations about what it means to really be sexually free and what identity really is. And uh, he wanted to have that conversation with me. So I want you to join us uh, and um, I hope you learned some things. Cynthia, thank you so much for being here with us. And would you share a little bit about yourself with us? Yeah, I mean, sure. How do I give you the short version? Um, the long version is in my first book, Prodigal Daughter, A Journey Home to Identity. <laughs> Let's just start by saying that because, you know, the long version is uh, it involves a really crazy tale of coming to know Christ when I ran off at a very young age, looking for love in all the wrong places married the wrong guy, ended up in a prison cell in Italy and fought for two years to get home as a star witness in a trial against him, ended up having to escape from the country through Switzerland with a baby under my arm, because in all of that, I was pregnant. And uh, uh, yeah. Holy crap. I found Jesus in, in this prison cell came home two years later with the baby, started life over, and just, it's been a grand adventure story with the Lord ever since I fully surrendered and he rescued me from the clutches of a very abusive uh, marriage when I was young. And um, in my background, there's some sexual abuse and that as a child, at the hands of a relative. And that sort of resulted in me having a very confused um, identity and low self-esteem in my twenties, you know, where I was really trying to fill a void of pain. And, you know, I did it with boyfriends or sex or too much alcohol or famous friends and, and who, who had drugs accessible, like everything you try in your twenties. Um, and then some, because it looked very glamorous on the outside. Cause I was knee deep in Hollywood, you know? And so hmm. it's interesting how, when things look glamorous on the outside, people actually make so much room for them. And it's like, wow, you know, sin is sin is sin, whether it's dressed up glamorously or not. And, um, you know, so th that all kind of drove me toward Jesus and it's, it, you know, my deliverance from all of that and the redemption in my life and the restoration of my life and the amazing uh, relationship that my son has with the Lord and that my husband has with the Lord. And he's an incredible man of God. Like all of the blessings have come from my actual surrender to Christ on every level in my life and giving him these issues, you know, that caused you to have so much confusion about sex and sexuality and its place in your life and its importance. And, you know, how do you come to believe that sex is sacred when you start your life out as a child with someone stealing your innocence and teaching you that sex is very unsacred and not good. And, um, you know, when I look at society around us today, when I look at social media, you know, I see how like, wow, like not everyone is, has sexual abuse in their background. Although a lot of people do, I can see it playing itself out behaviorally all over the place. But for those who don't, I see these, I see this playing out of all this behavioral stuff too. And it's just, it's just that we live in a culture of lies. That is telling us that the emperor is beautifully clothed and he's not, he's naked, you know? And um, a lot of our history as a world, 
as a nation, you know, through that feminist movement and the sexual revolution to the latest revolution, you know, which plays itself out in things like dating apps and Me Too. And these are all parts of this, like, revolution of how we're going to express ourselves. And we've just been sold a crock of lies. And we've kind of accepted them, you know, for, I think for lack of knowing what to accept, you know. Um, but it's interesting because when you separate us out as believers, we've accepted the lies also. You know, we we have in large part accepted a lot of lies about what's what is God given sex and sexuality? And so from my background, Shane, I, I just wanted to unpack it all in this book, which I feel is the culmination of a lot of things. I, I won't say everything I was meant to teach. I hope not, you know, but certainly everything that I'm uniquely equipped to share about um because i never share from a place of not understanding the trauma or what has driven the behavior or the dialogue i i pretty much feel that i have been equipped to share from a place of everything you know it's like i i, I don't judge people because i i get i get the issues people struggle with but what i what i do honestly and truthfully do is try to speak the truth in love and not hold back from the truth um, because we don't need to feel happy and not awkward in our seats as we go to hell. Hmm. You know, we need to be challenged and we need to be challenging each other out of hell. And, you know, I, I love Charles Finney's book, Lessons in Revival. And I love that one of the things he sa says basically in one part, and it, it it challenged me to death, was like when he's like saying, like, you say you love your brother and your sister, yet you sit by and you watch them go to hell. Like, and, you, and you're nice to them and you don't want to offend them. And you, you know, well, offend me, please, if you're keeping me out of hell, offend me. Say to me, hey, sin, you're wrong. Like you shouldn't think that way. Like the way that you're thinking isn't right. Like spend time. You know, I, I think that love is really spelled T-I-M-E. Um, and I think that Christians are really confused about what godly love is today. And that's why they're so confused about a lot of these agendas, like the trans agenda and the LB, LGBTQ, whatever it is, plus agenda. I I, I think we we're supposed to love everyone. But I think we're supposed to have an answer that's rooted in God's God's wisdom for our faith. So I don't know. That was a long way home to the answer, I guess. But perfect. That's perfect. <laughs> uh, Cynthia, how, I'm I'm interested about you offending people. <laughs> what um do you does does anything come to mind? I mean, how how does that like play out? Uh you are you talk to a lot of people, you get to interact with them. Um is this something that you I, I'm interested to know like if it's something that you feel convicted to do or called to do with any sort of regularity where it's like, oh like they need to hear it this way or oh you believe this or like what that actually looks like in application. If it's you just kindly saying uh, maybe um, a truth that's being avoided, or if you feel like a sort of prophetic conviction on a regular basis. Ah, that's a good question. Um, I, I think obviously like we should be walking in the spirit, right? So that the Holy Spirit kind of lets us know when to open our mouth and how to open our mouths. So, you know, I'm in a, I, I mean, I grew up in Hollywood. So there are lots of rooms that I'm in and have been in with friends of mine who are gay or, you know, um, I, I love RuPaul, you know, who is RuPaul. And, uh, you know, Andre, his real name, um, is a lovely, humble, beautiful man. Uh, and so when I'm around the different people that I'm 
put in situations to be around. I try to let the Holy Spirit lead my mouth and my heart. Um, I try to let the Holy Spirit lead with in wisdom, you know, and I, I think, and then I just have a God given skill of being able to call it like it is. If, you know, if, and when I'm asked to, I mean, you know, and sometimes when I'm not asked to, yeah, you know, um, interestingly enough, Shane, I, I lost more friends in Hollywood like my close in my close inner circle the 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 one friend that i lost it was never over jesus and my my beliefs in the bible it was because as my knowledge of the bible and my belief in jesus increased my voting changed so i, I lost him over trump more than over for yeah. like anything else it was amazing to me and you know he's a gay man and and i was like that is so interesting like you how could you question that i wouldn't have changed the way that i vote you know i i i, I grew up in hollywood a democrat you know i mean it's at a certain point i have to ask any christian well what book are you reading because like i don't know if you're reading a book it's not about a political party but it does change the way that you vote if one party is like yes, let's just celebrate sin and let's just kill some babies and it's okay. Then you have another party probably filled with equally as, you know, e evil, you know, e with, with as equal. That's the word that came to mind for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? It's not like, it's not like, look, we don't have a Democrat or a Republican problem. We have a Jesus problem. So it's yeah. not like both yeah. one side is, you know, the Republicans are perfectly Jesus. No, I don't think that at all. I do think that there are policies socially and morally that have, t for whatever reasons, typically aligned with a more conservative party. And so I find myself, you know, this independent minded person. And that's really what it is. Like we should all be independently thinking and processing through how we should vote for different candidates based upon who's going to align with God's truth more. And um, so anyway, but that, that, that is interesting because that is what has lost me friends in quote unquote Hollywood, um, which I find, I, I also think it's, it's because like when you, when you're a Christian, right. And you're dealing with people who are non-Christians and you're coming from a place of love, Right. We want to come from a place of love. But oftentimes what happens is we're coming from a place of love and we would never say anything offensive. We're coming from a place of love. So we would never really say the truth. And we're coming from a place of love. And if we don't speak the truth, the other side doesn't know the truth because they ain't reading the same Bibles that we're reading. Right. They're not reading. So it's all OK because there's this kind of peaceful ignorance of what you believe on one side. And this peaceful desire not to confront what they don't know on the other side. So yeah, I think that's a good analysis, actually. Yeah. yeah, you can easily kind of flow and and it's like, oh, I'm being loving. And I'm like, well, are you, you know, are you right? or are you just peacefully watching someone choose their way into hell and not saying, hey. I know you might not want to speak to me after this, but man, Jesus loves you and he died for you. And he, he, you got to repent of your sin because your sin is killing you. Not God, not loving you. It's not what's killing anybody. God's there waiting, open arms. Hello, hello, choose me. You're making your bed in hell. Do you know I'm actually there in hell with you when you make your bed there? If you just choose me, call out to me. Well, we need to be saying those things, you know, we need to be saying those things and saying those things today gets you canceled, shunned, uninvited, unincluded. Your invite to the cool birthday party gets lost in the mail. But I guess I just came to a point in my life where the, the hurt over that doesn't mean more than the hurt 
if I get to the end of my life and God says, well, I never knew you get away from me. You didn't go in through the narrow gate. You went in through that really wide road with all those other people and a parade and a, the red carpets and everything going. And, and that was the road to hell daughter. I just, yeah. Yeah. I, th I think too, that there's an aspect of like, if I actually have a relationship with people, I think they might at the end of days rise up with God as well and say, why didn't you ever tell me? Well, that's heavy, you know, right. and it's just, it's not just incrimination from the sovereign throne, but also, you know, in the reconciliation of all things like them standing and saying, like, Hey, like you knew this the whole time and you didn't say anything. Like if I, I do, I really care about these people. Uh, and yeah. so I think that that, that cashes out as a pretty strong motivation as well. You'd say. Yes. Yeah. It's all the motivation. You know, because these aren't like people out there that I don't know. These are people in my own family. These are people in my own circle of friends. These are people I've been friends with for, you know, 40 years, 30 years, 20 years. I care, you know, and and if if what motivates us is not love, and this is why some of the left right thing, I think, gets really ugly and polarized is because very few people of any are speaking from the right motivation and that motivation should be love. The truth should always be coming from a place of love because the truth can be devastatingly difficult to deal with for most people. The truth is Pandora's box yeah. in your life. You know, yeah. yet I remember, I, I remember, uh, at a certain point in my life, I was like, yeah, okay, I'm opening Pandora's box. I don't care what it takes. To your point from earlier, because this uh, this really plays the time, time, not, uh, sorry, love, not just as tolerance, but love as time. Uh, yeah. Because it's it's really easy for me to spout something off. And it costs me so much more to give someone my presence day in and day out. To like yep. let them into my home and to make sure my home is like somewhat clean and to like create time and calendar them in and create food. All these things co actually cost me something. Yes. Yes. And that's, that's why, look, I think a lot of Christians today are just lazy. You know, it's easier. <laughs> it's easy to go along with the, with the secular culture of lies, because at the end of the day, we don't really want to take the time to help those people over there who look differently, live differently, dress differently. And oh my gosh, they're, they're sinners. Well, no, we're, we're sinners too. <laughs> and, and love is spelled T-I-M-E and how that's why Finney's so powerful. How can you say you love your brother? If you won't take the time to actually invest in their lives, you, you know, and I know, right. That like it's relationship. It's all about relationship. It is though. My, my friends allow me, you know, my friends who think differently than me, allow me to speak into their lives about very difficult issues be only because we have relationship. I've led Jewish friends of mine to Jesus. That didn't happen over dinner one night with a stranger. That was years of relationship yeah. of them watching and observing how I live my life and being the one that they always went to for advice because my advice was rooted in godly wisdom. You know, they may have thought, oh, Cynthia's so wise, but eventually they got it. Oh, no, she actually just really lives this Bible. And these are biblical truths that she's giving me. She and knows God. I, yeah. And I want to try that. I want some of that. Like we have to make it look appealing. And it only looks appealing if you invest time with people. And, you know, the trans issue today, all of these issues today that Christians are so up in arms about, even straight, I mean, even non-Christians are up in arms about their children being taught a trans agenda in their schools, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, as I say in my new book, if you're not speaking to your kids, who is? Like, get right. unsilent, dudes. Start, yeah. start parenting. 
start investing time in your children, start teaching them about the beauty and the sacredness of sex so that they're not listening to a side that's giving them an unsacred view of sex, number one. Number two, rather than fearing this agenda, because you never win a battle with weapons of fear, you win a battle by using weapons grounded in wisdom, power, and love. You know, that's that. How do we protect our children? Wisdom, power, which comes from God, and love, which really has to be God's love too. And it means you need to understand what God's love really looks like. And and you know, we have to invest more time in these people with these other issues, in understanding them and helping them get healed, and not going along with pretending that a boy can be a girl or a girl can be a boy, but by helping them understand why we have a different, why, why we, look, it's not even why we have a different truth. I mean, this is science and biology, you know, but we get caught in arguing, arguing instead of wisely uh, dialoguing our way into like, what's the right way to deal with these issues. It takes a lot of time. It does. Yeah. It does. And you are right. I think the uh, like h- hormone treatment on children, it, it is experimentation. It's child experimentation. And like, I mean, the because Europe is a couple of years ahead of us. So this started as, you know, like kind of a political propaganda and then people start practicing it. But like those kids are adults now and they're suing the heck out of those governments. They're saying we were children. What did you let us do to ourselves? Like so many of those governments are in lawsuits at the highest, highest courts. And it's just like, oh my gosh. Cause they're, oh. it's like, talk about like, do we care about people? It's like, well, those people are adults now. And they're like, what the heck have you done to me? I was a child. Right. Right. Yeah. How sick. I mean, if these, if like, I would expect my child to look at me and say, how sick are you as a parent that you, I was, I was a, yeah. I mean, but I see it. I've got friends and friends of friends who are allowing their 10 year olds and 12 year olds to start changing their identity. And it's like, you're the parent, but, but see, we're dealing also with a culture of parents that are twisted. Also, they never, they didn't, they didn't get it. No one, no one taught them. So they don't know enough to actually understand their role and their position and what they should be teaching their children. And this, you know, I get into all of this in this book. You do because to me, it was important to have this kind of dialogue. Like I, I have this chapter, right? And it's like the questions where I really try to deal with all the taboo questions that the kids are asking. So I wanted to present the chapter in such a way that young people could read it and go, oh, she gets it. And that older people could read it and go, whoa, is this what my children are asking? Is this what 13 year olds are doing? Yeah. There are cultures in in, in, all over the, the globe that are dealing with all these same issues. And, you know, these are not just secular kids or kids of those broken families. No, a lot of these are the, the, these people that we're talking about with these other issues, they're in church. They're in our churches. Like, what do we get? There are brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, they love the Lord. They, they're they just in a different stage of their relationship awareness of maybe what the Bible says, or maybe a conviction of the Holy Spirit on how that's supposed to play itself out in their lives. Like, like yeah, there's all manner of struggle, you know, going on and, and works in progress. And we gotta, we gotta, we gotta figure out how to love these people and help these pe- usher these people into truth, you know, cause truth doesn't change. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then I like uh, calibrating that, balancing it with knowing that truth is embodied in a human being, right? Uh, That is literally the incarnation. And so I I love, I love what you're doing. Um, Okay. So 
A question I found myself being pulled against uh, is on one side, as a Christian, on one side, there's there's the hookup culture, there's sexual liberation, which uh, which you address really, really well in your work. Um, and on the other side, there's there's this really adverse reaction in Christianity against purity culture and this like really gnarly terror or allergy against even any sort of like sexual culture supplanting purity culture because like people like i mean Sheila Gregoire who have like audiences that are massive uh i mean we're like talking like tens of thousands of women and they're not just like hurt for no reason like yeah purity culture did some did some ish um and so there's this like this tension on either side of okay like a sexual ethic in the church didn't work. So what's the answer? Hookup culture. But then people who are trying to come out of a hookup culture are in this dilemma because it's like, oh, well, there's a vacuum because we haven't been able to like fill this gap from purity culture. So I'd love to hear you speak with them. I think a lot of people find themselves in that position where it's like, what the heck? Yeah. Well, because, you know, so first of all, you know, purity culture and the gosh, and the guy who wrote the book on it isn't even a Christian anymore, yeah. right? He's yeah. he's just run from the church. Yeah. Um, so that ought to tell you, don't be mad at Jesus if you've been damaged by purity culture because Jesus had nothing to do with that book. That was a I hate to say it, but it was a handful of guys who got together and decided what the slut shaming rules of the day were gonna be. Yeah. And they were the Pharisees who created the rules to put on our backs. But again, the Pharisees were not helping people carry and, and those, the load of those rules. No one was shepherding people. Well, how do I actually walk this out when my hormones are raging and when what's going on in my flesh is very real? And so unfortunately, the whole purity culture thing what it didn't do is point people to Christ, point people to purity in their relationship with Christ and explain to people that we're, we're really just all sinners in need of a savior. And what I really have tried to do in my book is acknowledge that this doctrine had a ton of mistakes in it. We are all sinners in need of a savior. And the purity that God wants from us starts in our mind. It's, it's purity in our mind, it, purity in our relationship with him, yeah. which impacts our mind, right? The first thing, yes. The first thing we do in this spiritual warfare that we're in is put on the helmet of salvation. Amen. What is that? That's our relationship with Christ. Our salvation in Christ protects our mind. It's on our head, right? In, in the covering of all of this, the breastplate of righteousness, which protects our heart. You know, the, the buckle of truth, like the belt of truth, like, which keeps our pants on, you yeah, know, like yeah. literally, like if you really died in here with us, you realize that that's the only, the, the only place if you decide today, I want to be pure. Okay. I want to abstain from sex. I want to be a Christian who doesn't have sex before marriage. All right. Well, just wanting that isn't enough. You've got to get really pure in your relationship with Christ. And then from that knowledge of truth and that alignment of truth, your, your, your mind is going to follow, your soul is going to follow, and your body is going to follow eventually. You can't lead this in the flesh with your body. You know, you, it has to start in your mind. It has to. And, and, and you know, it's mind, body, and soul. Right. It really it's mind, it really should be mind, soul, and then body. Cause I think the body follows everything that the, the mind has determined to do. If in my mind, I determined to make a covenant over my eyes. So I'm not going to look at pornography, right? Or I'm not going to look at certain things that the culture of lies says it's so it's okay. You know, plug it in the matrix, man. It's all okay. You know what I mean? It's only when you unplug from the matrix that you go, wait a minute, whoa, I'm seeing now, having taken the red pill. I'm seeing through eyes of truth. Uh-oh, the world is gnarly. 
So if you want to remain unplugged, and I highly recommend that you do, you got to deal with how to navigate this gnarly culture of lies. And so the first thing I think in, in a, in an attempt to be, you know, I, I, I call for a purity revolution because I feel like it is a revolutionary way of thinking and deprogramming our minds, you know, and our lives and ourselves that we, we need. Um, it has nothing to do with the purity doctrine of the past. It has to do really and truly with what does purity look like today for me in my life. And, and that has to be rooted in what purity looks like rooted in the Bible as determined by God, you know, as determined by Christ and realizing that, you know, we have Christ as a savior and the Holy spirit strengthens us to be able to walk these things out. You know, um, I stood on this one scripture at a certain point in my life, in my, I don't know, maybe my thirties and I was dating, uh, 30 years ago, right? I was dating um, a man that was completely inappropriate for me to be dating, not because he was a bad person, but just because he, number one, he was married. Number two, he he was incredibly famous and everyone around me was caught up in the incredible fame of it. Mm. And so no one said to me, this really isn't right. Mm. You know, I was caught in every lie that a young girl can be caught in. Well, he loves me more than her. Well, they have a horrible marriage. Well, it's dysfunctional. Well, it, all of that. Girls, if you're in it, you're just in a lie, you know? And and I was I was so young when I was in my 20s, you know, when it started. And at a certain point, as I was really now getting closer to Christ and surrendering Christ. I was like, this is wrong. I got, I got to stop it. And I was like, Lord, it's bigger than me. Like, I don't know. I, it's big than me. I mean, even if I determine that I'm not going to do something, then he comes over and then we end up where we shouldn't be. Like, you know, then it was like this, all of a sudden the scripture came alive. Oh, wretched man that I am. The good in me is not the good that I want to do yet. Instead, I do the bad that is in me to do. Like what that scripture was like, Okay, I get it. I get it. I get how I get that feeling of being so caught in a sinful thing that you can't, it's bigger than you. You cannot stop it on your own. That's when you realize how desperately you need Jesus. You need the Holy Spirit to do it for you. So then I was like, what Holy Spirit? How Holy Spirit? And then the scripture came to me. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. I remember sitting there grappling with this and I was like, Resist the enemy and he will flee from me. Okay. Okay. What does resistance look like? And it was like, well, how about this? No, I cannot come and visit you on set. It's after 8 p.m. Nothing good's going to happen. Mm. Nothing good's going to happen. And then all of a sudden, I just started saying no to situations in which I knew I'd be pushed into a compromise, whether it was because I didn't know how to say no. A lot of my inability to say no had to do with a lot of things that were broken from being sexually abused. So it would be years before I would confront all of that. You know, at the time, I didn't know how to live in the power zone of I've confronted all those issues. Now I know who I am as a woman of, of God. But at that time, I was a, a young girl. And the only thing I could do was stand on scripture because I didn't have much knowledge. So when those scriptures would come to me, I would test them, test them, test them. And man, man, do they prove themselves true in your life. If you resist the enemy, he will flee from you. And through the years and the people that I've <clears throat> come across, male and female, who struggled with things like pornography, right? It's like, I'm like, listen, dude, resist the enemy and he will flee from you. Mm. And, and sometimes resistance just looks like I'm not turning on the television. I'm not getting on the computer. You know, it just, when the moment gets you or whatever's going on in your mind, whatever is happening, walk the other way. God will then meet you with grace. He will. He will meet you with supernatural grace. And all of a sudden you're like, I got a victory. I got a victory. And eventually the victories start to add up. 
and you realize now you're walking in a victory zone and you've you've learned to use the boxing gloves that God has given you scripturally to you know put on your armor to know how to fight these things and then you know the enemy's clever he'll go find something else but we're always in a war with our flesh the second that killing your flesh becomes important to you you're in a battle with it but it's okay because we can win and we do win you know and um it feels good to win because then you realize that you can take your experiences and help other people win you know i th i think also to your point that you know there's there's this weird twist in the biblical narrative of God giving us a thousand yeses in the garden of Eden and one no. And today we feel like everything, like God calls us to like only say no and like, where are the yeses? So it's like, Oh, like I have to flee again. I have to flee again. Um, and I think that there is like that inversion of like, Oh, like, and then we'll start learning how to say yes. But we, I think your book does this really well of like, we're enslaved we're not saying yes when we watch porn. We we don't actually have a choice. Like that's compulsion. You're a slave. Uh, and so you, you saying no is actually you saying yes. Like you actually are gaining agency. God is giving you dignity. Yes. Uh, I'd, I'd love to hear you riff on that a little bit. Yeah. Your yes, your yes to something that is destroying your soul or your no to something that is destroying your soul is your yes to the very thing that wants to free your soul, that is freeing your mind. What we've said yes to in our society today is bondage. We're in total bondage. Women are not more empowered today than they were before the feminist movement and the sexual revolution. No, what we're empowered to do is to treat ourselves the way men treat us. We're empowered to act like men. We're empowered to be sexually promiscuous. We're empowered to have to take our clothes off on social media if we want five seconds of attention or validation, which we're looking for outside of ourselves ad nauseum, right? Like we're not empowered in any way. We're actually completely disempowered, degraded, and set back thousands of years prior to any of these revolutions. These movements actually have failed. Where we were the most empowered was when we were like, oh, I don't have sex with freely and casually. I'm waiting for my husband. So it's like, there's 10 guys in front of you. You don't see my real value. You just want to get in bed with me. Edit, swipe, mm -hmm. swipe left. You know, oh, you want to, oh, that's what you want. Swipe left and you swipe left, swipe left, swipe left. Oh, wait a minute. Our faith aligns. Our values align. You're committed to being abstinent until you're married because you get that we're the bride of Christ and that you want to respect me as God's daughter. Oh, swipe right. I can continue here. I can now proceed prayerfully and safely. We can get to know each other as friends because even when you hit a swipe right, now you have to prayerfully understand, well, is this my person? Is this the husband or the wife that God has given me? Because I see this in the church a lot. You know, you're so desperately hungry as young people to find your person that any old Christian will do. Yeah. And the reality is that it can't be any old Christian. It has to be the Christian man or woman that is made for your walk and your journey and your calling who fits in with who you are. Two whole people becoming that whole unit that has a service of Christ in unison. There's a synchronicity to your service of Christ together. That is completely how it is with my husband. I mean, that, that, and the Lord showed me that one day in prayer when he was just a friend, he gave me an image of these two, um, looked like Egyptian soldiers. Cause they were sort of like mummified looking beings. There was no male, there was no female. And we were both wrapped in white gauze and one would walk this way the other would follow then it would flip and one would walk the other way the other would follow one would go left the other was following left one would go right the other was following right and we were doing that 
at the feet of Christ on a throne. And he was so big, I couldn't even see him in the in this vision while I was in prayer with this friend, Roger, who would later become my husband. Hmm. But God showed me what our relationship looked like and what it was about. And then I got it. Whoa, what God has joined together. Let no man put asunder because God is joining together a unit that he has created with perfect purpose to serve him. Don't you come in and mess with that. Not even the two of you. Like my marriage vow all of a sudden was really deep because it was like, okay, no one gets to put this asunder because there's God created purpose in this. There's a God created service in this. And we're not looking at coupling as deeply as we should. And we must. We must. It, it, it's it's when you start to get it on this level with Christ, then you understand. Okay, I'm choosing a mate, and it's as important as the CEO of, you know. It's as important as the president of America of the United States of America choosing a vice president. You know, it's that important. This yeah. is your house. It's called the White House, and the first lady in that house needs to run it a certain way and represent the values that I as the covering over this house as the man, the values I'm trying to communicate, you know? And I, so I think as believers, we have to talk about this. We have to open this dialogue up in churches. We have to make all of us feel a lot more uncomfortable about how we're approaching coupling. You know, um, I do a chapter in my book on dating apps right? You know, I was riffing about swiping left and swiping right. It was, it was like the last chapter to hit me. And I had to go back in these revolutionary movements and deal with it. Cause I'm like, this is where these young people are today. My publishing company didn't get it at all. I mean, I fought so many battles with them. Like really mm -hmm. guys, I mean, seriously, are you guys also out of touch that you don't understand that your young people are using dating apps too? Like, mm -hmm. come on, like, this is part of the problem. It's part of the problem. So, um, so we're, I'm writing this chapter and, and it was, it sort of stems out of, you know, people saying, well, I mean, dating apps, I don't think those are right for Christians. And it's like, no, there's the problem isn't with a dating app. The problem isn't even with social media. The problem is lies in your mindset and your heart condition and your intent as you use those dating apps or social media. If you are on a dating app to hook up, you are the problem, not the app. If you are on a dating app and your profile says, I'm, I'm abstinent until I'm married. I believe in Jesus. He is my Lord and Savior. I want to raise my children in this way. And I'm looking only for Christian men who 1000% align and agree with my beliefs. You're good. You're golden. <laughs> Because nobody is going to swipe on your profile unless they are really there with you because they already know they're going to get told, hey, deuces, if you try to come at me with something less than the full measure of the Beyonce song, if you want it, then you better put a ring on it. Whoa, oh, oh, right? Because yeah. that's all I'm here for. And it's like, we've just got to be a lot more honest and, you know, okay with not having a thousand dates. We just need the one person, you know? The, before I, I want to honor time. So before we close, I just, I'm torn between two questions. Uh, I'm going to say both of them in the hopes that you create a hybrid answer. Okay. Um, coming into this, I felt like it was important to ask you the question, what do you care about? Not what are you supposed to care about? What did not, what did you care about last year? What do you, what do you care about? The other question is, what do you long to see? Oh, uh, well, I long to see what I care about. Um, and what I care about is seeing people especially my young sisters in Christ. You know, um, I have a lot of spiritual daughters and spiritual sons and I love young people, you know, 20 and thirties college, like 
there's still hope for them, you know, to change the world. And I want to see them walking in the fullness of a relationship with Christ, understanding that there is power in this thing that we believe in because we believe in a real God. He's real. And I long to see that because that is the thing that I care about. It's the thing I care about for my son. I know that true happiness lies in him, in him knowing at 31 years old that he is everything God created him to be, that he is amazing, that he is, you know, he is provided for, that God has his back. Like yeah. for him to have that confidence doing the anything that he has to do means that he is not for sale to anyone. Mm. There's nothing more attractive than a man who knows who he is in Christ who is rooted and grounded. He doesn't even have to speak. His power walks in the door with him. That's my husband, you know, and, and, and I know how powerful that is. And if women understood their beauty from that angle, then we would understand how much power we have to lift up or to destroy God's sons, you know, and us going along with this culture of demasculine, demasculinizing, demasculinizing, demas yes. you know, what's the word? I like Emasculating. You with know where you. I'm going, yes, yes. right? Us going along with this is like harming our brothers and, and it's harming us at the end of the day. You know, there are only two things in which God creates the human race, male and female. In beginning, that's how he created us. And that is never going to change. And whether you are male or whether you are female, understanding your purpose as a male or a female is everything. And I'm just so passionate about all of us understanding and embracing our unique roles. They are mutually dependent. You know, they, 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 we need each other and we need each other the right way because it works when we work it. Yeah. Okay. So Cynthia, uh, if somebody is listening, um, so we can be inspired by an idea in the moment, um, but to actually start implementing it to like actually start seeing the fruit of the good news requires a bit more. If somebody's listening and they're like, this is, this is rad. I love what she's saying. I really want more of this in my life. How? Well, you mean in terms of how do they, how do they find the book? How I do want, they... I, I, I want, I don't want to be a part of hookup oh. culture. Um, but I, I feel, I feel the indignation that people reacting to purity culture are talking about. And I hear what you're saying, Cynthia, and I want that, but I, I don't know how to like walk towards it one day at a time. What does it look like for me to walk towards it one day at a time? Okay. That great question. Now I get it. What does it look like? It looks like you making a decision in this moment that that's what you want. And then every day dealing with each day, ask God to give you grace and strength for today, for right now to deal with this choice you're making. And as temptation comes, remember, the Bible says, if you resist the devil, he will flee from you. So you just need to resist a little bit and, and God's going to run. He's going to run to meet you right there. And he will help you with the rest of it. And, and then you need to get, you need to get into the word because you do need to understand what the word of God says, because that's your strength. That's your two edged sword that you fight with. Right. And listen, it, 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 it get a translation. You understand you know, um, I, when I first got saved and started reading the Bible, I read what's called the good news translation. It is technically the Bible for third graders. Nice. Uh, but, but the reality is, is that if I were left to read King James, I would not be saved today. Yeah. Hithers, thithers and thous just bored me and made me glaze over. So, you know, get the NLT, get an NIV, get, get a translation that you love. Um, there's some unique tools out there like blueletterbible.org that you can use to read different translations of the same thing. You can also get Bible commentaries. There's some amazing men of God. My favorite is Chuck Smith. 
He started the Calvary Chapel movement. He led the Jesus uh, revolution through the 70s when all the hippies got saved. He's no longer with us, but his Bible studies and his Bible commentaries are the best I've ever seen. Mm. They're clean, they're easy, they're straight to the point. And when I say clean, I mean, they're like simple to understand. Yeah. They're not full of a ton of a words to like lose you. They're just easy. They're people speak. Um, and find people that will answer your questions. If you have questions, send me your questions. You know, send them in through CynthiaGarrett.org. I, I don't mind answering questions. You know, I'm married to a man of God who is such a scholar of the word. And um, a lot of times I'll go to him and say, hey, I have a heavy theolo theology question from this person. And we try to answer it, you know, so so do it, you know, take advantage of it. And I, I do encourage you, read the book. There's a chapter in the book that answers all of the questions that you could possibly have about sex and sexuality. And I do it in an honest, pure way because we need to hear the truth straight, not like watered down and prettied up so that you think that those of us in positions of leadership are now perfect. Mm. No, we're not perfect. We're works in progress. Yeah. You know, all of us are works in progress. But Jesus said, be ye continually transformed by the renewing of your mind in Christ Jesus. So start each day. Each day, commit yourself to reading a truth that will help you renew your mind and transform your mind in Christ. Amen. And know that you are loved. He loves you. He loves you so much that, you know, he sent his son to die for you. Mm. It's pretty heavy truth. Mm. You know, simmer in it, marinate in it. You're special. You know, you're special. That's what I would say. Amen. And that, ladies and gentlemen, concludes this week's episode of the Cynthia Garrett podcast. I really hope you enjoyed the conversation. I'm still sitting here a little bit moved by all of the confusion around this topic, but I hope that we actually provided a little clarity this week. I'll see you guys next time. <music>